Well, good evening, everyone. Um, Mike Manning here, uh, broadcasting live from the um, Navy Yard here in Charlestown, Mass, um, on Pier 8, just a few hundred yards from the Constitution, and um, maybe a 15-minute walk from Bunker Hill um, Monument. Just want to recognize Alice. She has been instrumental in keeping us going here um, in a virtual world. Um, she has really been um, incredibly helpful technically to keep us um, going here. Also want to recognize my fellow friends of the Boston Harbor Walk. Um, that's Sarah, Liz, Jan, Laurie, Steve, um, Scott, Eric, and Paul. These are really the core members of the Friends of the Boston Harbor Walk. And you can see on this um, first slide, we're an all volunteer group. As Alice mentioned, we're affiliated with Boston Harbor now. I guess you could say they're our parent organization. And we really have um, a mission to create awareness, um, promote public enjoyment, and, and really foster local stewardship of the 43 miles of, of Boston's Harbor Walk. So we just had our seventh um, anniversary formed in January uh, 2014. And we have three priorities that we really spend nearly all of our time on. Um, number one, um, hosting interpretive tours such as tonight. Um, typically these would be uh, in person, primarily walking tours. Sometimes we've given um, bicycle tours and on occasion a kayak tour. So we have multi modes of presenting our tours. But since the pandemic broke, we've really pivoted again with Alice's help and, and gone with, um, with virtual webinars. Um, so that's really kind of our, our prime mission here is hosting these tours. Uh, number two, we partner with um, waterfront property owners and stakeholders. There are over 300 separate property owners along Boston's Harbor Walk. And we have one of our volunteers, Liz Nelson Weaver, who gives tours, but she actually also leads our signage initiative team. It's a small subset within the Friends of the Boston Harbor Walk, and they research and design what I think are some of the most incredible signs along um, or in Boston. They are along the Harbor Walk um, and she and her team have done um, just phenomenal, phenomenal work. Then lastly, we organize um, waterfront cleanups. For the most part, the Harbor Walk is maintained very well by those property owners. And those property owners could be the city, um, it could be the state, uh, could be the federal government, um, but many of them are, are private um, property owners. And for the most part, they do a phenomenal job of keeping their properties um, clean and well-maintained. But there are some segments on the Harbor Walk that need a little more care. And um, Eric Banke and Paul, um, Paul work with me to um, really organize and manage cleanups. And the cleanups, are actually volunteers. Um, these could be colleges and universities, high schools, or businesses. And Paul Federico, Eric Banky, and myself work with the volunteers to clean up some segment of the Harbor Walk. We also, Alice and I also get any uh, notifications from the city through the City of Boston's 311 service. This is where constituents, residents, and or visitors can email, text, call in, fax, some maintenance issue on the Harbor Walk. And that goes to Alice, and then it goes to me, and then I usually notify the property owner that there's some maintenance or repair issue that um, needs to be um, taken care of. And for the most part, property managers are, are very, very responsive. So it makes my work and Alice's work um, so much easier when we have cooperation from, from the property owners. So uh, the Great Molasses Flood, tonight's um, topic, um, I typically, as Alice mentioned, give this one in a PowerPoint presentation um, in a conference room setting. And then we actually, um, in 2019, we actually took a trolley ride to the site of the Great Molasses Flood. Obviously we can't do that tonight but I have a lot of photographs and um, graphics that will hopefully 
um, hone you in as to where this happened, why it happened, um, so on and so forth. It is definitely one of the most bizarre and tragic occurrences in the city of Boston, and maybe even in most major cities um, in, in the United States. Boston, one of the oldest cities in the country, um, you know, founded in 1630, is one of the most densely populated cities in North America. I think as of the new census, it's um, third after New York City and San Francisco, the city itself, not the metropolitan area. So we have very densely populated um, neighborhoods. So I thought before jumping directly into the Great Molasses Flood, we talk about some of the other disasters or tragedies that um, have occurred from Boston's founding as a town in 1630 um, all the way up to um, the 20th century. So the first one that I, I delved into is um, the draft riot of 1863. Um, this occurred in the North End and the North End at that point in time was heavily populated with Irish immigrants. It would eventually turn um, at the turn of the century um, to mainly Italian, but during the Civil War years, the North End was primarily Irish immigrants fleeing the Great Potato Famine in Ireland and coming to the United States. Unfortunately, the North End at that point was really a slum and it was very, very difficult living circumstances. So in 1863, in the summer, um, federal agents came to the North End to basically give out draft notices to Irish immigrants. And this was not looked upon with much favor from the immigrants. And Again, I can't get into all the details. Each one of these paragraphs could be an hour onto itself, but to highlight it, um, there was a riot. Um, the state militia, which was based on George's Island, if you can imagine this, had to make their way from George's Island via boat, come ashore in Boston, make their way to an armory that was in the North End, and get weapons and so on and so forth. <clears throat> the end result was, unfortunately, the loss of 10 to 12 um, civilian deaths. This happened right on Prince Street, um, literally a block behind the, um, the garage where the um, Brinks job was um, in 1950. So if you're walking along Commercial Street, you take a left, um, onto Prince Street, and that building is still there, and it's number 146. So to make a, um, a long story short, the civilians, which were primarily Irish immigrants, tried to storm the armory and get weapons. And the um, state militia arrived before the immigrants did, and they fired um, a cannon from inside the armory to the immigrants who were literally beating down the doors to get in. And it wasn't, it was actually a blank cannon round. It wasn't a live round, but it still, it blew the doors open to the armory and it unfortunately killed 10 to 12 civilians. And they were, they were quickly brought back or they were quickly brought away from, from the scene by their, by their neighbors. The next one, and I'm, I'm going in chronological order, um, is the Great Boston Fire of 1872. Now, what happened in, in Boston in 1822 was the town of Boston incorporated and became a city um, in 1822. 30 years later, Boston, the city of Boston became the first city in the world with a telegraph-based fire alarm system which believe it or not, is still fully functional today. If you come into the city, and again, I'm, I'm here in Charlestown, or if you go to South Boston or Dorchester, you will see lighted poles with a pull down. And that pull down is mechanical and sends a signal via a telegraph. And that's why we are able to know exactly when the Great Boston Fire began in 1872. 
It began on Summer Street near Fire Pull Box number 52 at 7.24 p.m. That's how accurate the records are. The fire only lasted 12 hours, but if you can imagine, it burned from South Station on Summer Street, just shy of the Old South Meeting House on Washington Street. Over 700 structures were destroyed. It looks like Dresden, Germany after the Second World War. There was just complete and utter destruction. Fortunately, um, the loss of life was relatively um, small. Um, again, the records on how many people died were not that well kept and somewhere between 15 to 30 civilians um, lost their lives, including two Boston firefighters. Um, next, we have um, just over 100 years ago, and a lot of people have never heard of this one. And I'll be honest with you, it was news to me because somehow in my researching of history, I had not heard about this. But on election night in 1916, a trolley coming from my hometown or home neighborhood of South Boston was traveling on Summer Street. Um, it began its route on P Street at East First Street, where there was a um, elevate, Boston elevated car barn. It began its route there and began picking up passengers and was generally heading towards Summer Street, uh, Summer Street, and then eventually towards South Station. So it's heading north on Summer Street. It's approaching the Four Point Channel. And if you know Boston, you know there are multiple bridges across the Four Point Channel. And there is a bridge on Summer Street at the Four Point Channel. Unfortunately, as the trolley approached, the bridge was open. And there should have been a red lantern indicating to the engineer on the trolley that the bridge was open and the trolley should be stopped. Somehow, for reasons unknown till today, that lamp lantern was not there and the trolley proceeded, crashed through the gate and plunged directly into the Four Point Channel. Um, people, uh, unfortunately, were trapped in the trolley car uh, and the end result was 46 civilians just traveling in a trolley, going to South Station to either go to work for an evening shift or whatever the case may be, lost their lives um, on the Boston uh, elevated uh, railway that, um, that evening. Another fairly unknown disaster was the Pickwick uh, nightclub disaster in 1925. Um, this occurred in Chinatown on, on Beach Street, the building. Um, you can see the photograph on the right hand side there. Um, the building um, collapsed, basically the, sec the third floor collapsed onto the second floor and then the second floor crashed right through the first floor and this entire structure wound up um, in the basement. And un unfortunately, 44 civilians um, just on a night out dancing were killed at the Pickwick nightclub disaster. Now, this is really kind of a bizarre aspect of this, but a dance was banned um, as the result of the collapse of the Pickwick nightclub disaster. Um, any guesses out there? It's the Charleston, and not the Charlestown from where I am, but the Charleston, as in Charleston, South Carolina. For some reason, they thought when the um, patrons of the club were dancing and got in the line to form for the Charleston dance that that um, contributed to the collapse of um, the Pickwick nightclub. But that has never really been uh, confirmed. Then we have Boston's worst disaster. And um, through my day job um, in engineering and transportation, I actually got to know some Boston firefighters who have now since passed on, but were young firefighters when the Coconut Grove nightclub happened 
um, back in 1942. Um, this is in this is what's called the Bay Village. It it occurred um, near Stewart Street. I think today the the hotels changed names quite some time, but I believe it's now the Revere Hotel at 100 Stewart Street. This fire is the second worst in United States history. And in very short time, um, probably less than 15 minutes, 20 minutes, over 400 people uh, were killed. Um, and there were um, well over 100 injuries. And you can see the, um, the Boston Sunday Globe with the headline here. This came out early and nearly 100 additional people died by the time that um, the Boston Fire Department um, and the um, state fire marshal got involved and were able to extract um, all the bodies from um, the site of the Coconut Grove nightclub fire. Now, believe it or not, you know, its 80th anniversary is coming up next year. The cause of the fire is still undetermined. And um, I have a high school classmate um, who was commissioner of the Boston Fire Department up until um, a year ago, uh, Commissioner Finn, who retired. Commissioner Finn was at an event um, three years ago and said the cause is still undetermined. Now there are theories. Um, one was a busboy had a match and was trying to um, screw in a light bulb that someone had removed. There's another theory about an air conditioning system that released the gas that caused the fire. That is just conjecture. And the cause of the fire, and you can read the report, the cause of the fire is still undetermined at this point. The worst fire in US history was the Iroquois uh, nightclub fire and over 600 people lost their lives in that. If there's anything good out of the Coconut Grove nightclub fire was the tremendous change um, in, in fire codes, exits, signage, battery powered exit signs, um, so on and so forth. But it was a horrific event in Boston's history. This was Thanksgiving weekend. We all know what, you know, the Wednesday and, 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 and Friday of Thanksgiving weekend is, um, clubs, bars, the Coconut Grove nightclub had over a thousand people, which was well over what they were allowed to host uh, in terms of their permits. And there was a whole host of violations that unfortunately we just don't have time to get into, but it did trigger national code changes, which eventually became international code changes that have really to a degree prevented a massive um, loss of life um, as we saw right here in Boston in 1942. So that brings us to the Great Molasses Flood. Um, as Alice mentioned, um, 2019 at Centennial, um, just two years ago, January 15th. And again, we know very clearly the timing. Um, it was a relatively mild day here in Boston for January. Um, you know what we um, can have here. It's usually the coldest month in the city of Boston. Today we had four to six inches of snow. Um, it's usually in the 20s and colder. But on that day, it was unseasonably mild. Um, in the 40s, people were out and about. They were having lunch on the sidewalk. Children came out of their schools for a recess. Um, it was just an incredible day to be outside. And this occurred um, at 539 Commercial Street in Boston's North End. And if you know the North End, there are two baseball fields there, the Popolo baseball field, and then you have the Langone um, baseball field. The tank was basically centered on the present day Langone Park. Um, and the tank, we'll talk about more about the tank, but the tanks, a foundation is actually still there underneath Langone Park. It's covered in about 24 inches of cover, but the concrete foundation, um, which is three feet thick, 
um, and almost 100 feet in diameter is still there today at Langone Park. The tragic result was uh, the loss of 21 civilian deaths. Um, I can't run into the list, but um, the youngest um, casualties were um, a young boy and a young girl. They weren't related, different families. They were 10 years old. And I believe the oldest was a gentleman. He was a laborer and he was 76 um, years old. And there was another event later in 1919, and again, um, not well known, but in September of 1919, the Boston police went on strike. And unfortunately, there was a rioting, there was looting, I guess you could say there was an insurrection at some point, and um, eight people, um, mainly Boston police, um, officers who were striking lost their lives um, when the state militia was called out to suppress um, the riot. So just some background, um, molasses, we don't see molasses um, as much as um, I know uh, our families did here in, in, in Boston um, and you know, the quote unquote own days, but um, Molasses, it's a dark brown um, viscous liquid derived from the processing of sugar cane. Um, the sugar cane, and you can see a photograph here, it's typically about six feet tall. Um, the cane is cut, crushed, um, and then distilled, basically meaning it's boiled to extract um, the sugar. Um, the remaining syrup is known as first molasses, and that's the sweetest um, phase, I guess you could call, of the uh, distil distillation process. And it's, it's used for candy and cooking and so on and so forth. Um, then we have a second boiling and the byproduct of that is called second molasses. And again, it's less sweet. And then a third boiling um, yields what's called black strap molasses. And this is very dark. Um, it's very bittersweet. It's not pleasant to taste. And this is actually what's used for um, industrial alcohol. And again, I'll, I'll talk about that more in depth. Um, molasses historically from colonial, actually from pre-colonial times through colonial times had been imported to Boston from Cuba, uh, Puerto Rico and the West Indies. And unfortunately, it was part of the slave trade, that triangular um, slave trade between um, Cuba, Puerto Rico, the West Indies, the colonies in the United, in, well, the colonies in North America, and then um, West Europe. So the colonists really use molasses to produce an inexpensive sweetener because um, the sugar today that we know was just not in vogue like um, molasses was during colonial days, um, you know, all the way up through the 20s, uh, 1920s and the 1930s. Um, it was used as an ingredient in beer and rum, um, baked beans, brown bread. As a Bostonian growing up in South Boston, there were very few Saturday nights where we didn't have um, hot dogs. Um, baked beans and brown bread made um, from scratch by my maternal grandmother who lived on our third floor um, in our triple decker. I mean, that was the highlight, as, at least for my dad, to have um, Saturday night hot dog, baked beans and, and brown bread. And it was also used as an ingredient in, in pumpkin pie. And as I had mentioned, historically, Molasses was really an indispensable part of Massachusetts, but even more so all of New England um, in their economies. So why was molasses being stored um, in the North End? It was being stored in the North End and then transported via surface rail tanker card um, to a factory in Cambridge for the various phases of um, distillation. 
So in the North End, it was really the crude, um, non-distilled product, literally off, off the boat, um, warmed as it left the boat so it would flow and then stored in the tank. So there are a number of um, byproducts from the distillation of molasses. And again, distillation is just a fancy term for boiling. So um, grain alcohol, 20% um, for alcoholic consumption, and then industrial alcohol um, made up the, um, the remaining 80%. Grain alcohol, primarily used for the production of rum, again, for alcoholic consumption. But during these times, and if you can think, 1919, um, World War I had just ended, grain um, industrial alcohol was utilized, believe it or not, for the production of munitions for the war effort, World War I, that the United States joined in April of 1917. The Allies, um, primarily Great Britain, France, and Italy, looking to the United States as they would in World War II as um, the United States as a supplier of war material. So dynamite, um, smokeless gunpowder, and other high explosives were a byproduct, believe it or not, of, of molasses. Also solvents, dyes, lacquers, motor fuel, you can distill uh, molasses and turn it into what was then called ethanol, which along with gasoline was used to power the first true generation of automobiles. So there was significant demand from DuPont, Edna, and other chemical explosive manufacturers looking for um, companies like Purity uh, Distilling, which was a company we'll talk here next about, to provide um, industrial alcohol really for the war effort during the First World War. So there was a company called U.S. Industrial Alcohol. It had a subsidiary here in Boston called Purity Distilling. And Purity negotiated and leased land from the Boston, the Boston Elevated Railway, sometimes called the L or sometimes called the Berry, if you look at the, um, make an acronym of, of its the capital letters there. And they acquired a lease to build and operate a large storage tank in the North End. Uh, the lease was approximately $5,000 annually. And then Purity, Distilling contracted with a company called the Hammond Iron Works to design and install for approximately $30,000 the tank um, in the North End for installation by December 31st of 1915. And the work began in mid to late October with the pouring of the concrete foundation. So um, this tank stuck out like the literal sore thumb. Um, it was 50 feet high, which is approximately the height of a five-story building. It was 90 feet in diameter. It was hold, designed to hold approximately two and a half million gallons of molasses. As I had mentioned, the tank was positioned on a three foot thick concrete foundation approximately 100 feet in diameter. So you had a 100 foot diameter base and then somewhat of a walkway around the tank, um, not what 10 feet um, or five feet less than the overall um, diameter of the tank. The tank was built with seven overlapping layers of steel and welding um, was not utilized like it is today. This tank, um, like the Brooklyn Bridge, like the Titanic, was actually secured with rivets. And that'll play a role um, later in the story. Now, the steel um, was built with, like I said, seven overlapping layers. The steel at the base of the tank was approximately five eighths inch thick. And then as you went up in height, the thickness of the tank was about three eighths inch in thickness. And again, that's, that's 
pretty common because the pressure is significantly lower at the top of the tank, you can allow for thinner thicknesses um, in the construction of the tank. There is a gentleman, um, I guess you can call him the antagonist, Arthur P. Gell. Um, he was purity distilling's treasurer and he was designated as the overseer of the construction of the tank. Unfortunately, he had no background in civil engineering, mechanical engineering, construction, or anything related. He was basically purity distilling's um, bookkeeper um, and treasurer. And you can see here um, in the background, um, this is the berry the Boston Elevated Railway. And we are looking towards um, the Steridi Rink, which is not there in this photograph, obviously, but just to give you an idea of, we're looking from, let's say the current US Coast Guard building, and we're looking towards um, the Charlestown Bridge. Here's a structure here. And then you can see the tank just really stands out as, um, uh, like I said, a, a, a sore thumb. Here's another photograph. And um, now we're looking from, let's say the Steridi rink near North Washington Street. And here's the tank and you can see it is within feet of the curve of the Berry, the Boston Elevated Railway. You can see this is the roof of that building we just saw in the previous photograph. And then this building is actually the rear of the current United States Coast Guard building on Commercial Street. So this building um, is still here today. The facade is brand new. The Coast Guard built a very nice facade, but this portion of the Coast Guard facility in the North End um, still stands there today. And you can see, this is amazing to me, you know, as an engineer, how much work went into the Boston Elevated Railway. This is up almost three stories. And I don't even know if sunlight can make it down to Commercial Street. I just, it's an incredible photograph. Here's another one. And again, we're near the Steridi Rink, today's Steridi Rink, looking back towards um, the North End. Um, Here's the tank. You can just make out the roof. You can see a railway car coming from um, South Station, making its way um, towards Charlestown, more than likely. This is the road, or this is the track to Charlestown. And then this, this is heading towards um, North Station. So you can see the tank, just the roof here. This is actually the smokestacks of the Lincoln Power Station. And that's connected because this power station is providing electricity um, to power the railway cars. Now, Lincoln Power Station was abandoned and was converted into condominiums in 1980. It's still there. It's a beautiful um, example of industrial architecture, but the smokestacks, and there were twin, um, they came down um, in the 1980s as the Lincoln Power Station uh, was being converted to condominiums. But again, we're on Commercial Street. Look at how densely packed everything is. Buildings here, the trestle, the tracks. This is pretty interesting too. Um, Early in my career, I worked um, for the Boston Gas Company um, in their transportation department. This is a gas holder. This is holding low pressure natural gas that is supplying street lamps throughout the North End um, and gas for cooking, heating, and so on and so forth. So again, look at how dense the North End is at the turn of, of the previous century. And you can see right here that part of the trestle is still under construction. These are planks, and this looks like a spool of, of cable, so on and so forth. So this trestle is still being worked on um, here uh, in this photograph. So Arthur Gell is not an engineer. He has no background in construction whatsoever. 
When you build a tank today or a cylinder, you're required to fill it completely and pressurize it to a certain factor, maybe 2.5 times, maybe three times. To save time and money, um, Arthur Gel only had the tank filled with water up to a level of six inches. That didn't even make it to the first layer of um, steel plates. They were in a rush to get the tank completed by the end of December uh, 2015 because they were losing money to competitors that were supplying industrial alcohol um, to um, those companies that I had mentioned because even though World War I had officially ended, the allies intervened into what was then the new Soviet Union and they were pro still providing arms and ammunitions to the allies that were involved in the intervention in the Russian Revolution. The tank leaked from the very beginning and that was well known. Um, the tank was caulked uh, numerous times and the tank leaked so severely that Arthur Gell hired a painting company to paint it a dark brown color to disguise the leaks from the public. When it was filled, and again, depending on how much molasses was required in the East Cambridge um, distillation factory, the tank was known to creak and moan at all hours of the night. Imagine you're in the North End, you've seen how densely packed that neighborhood is, you're hearing these strange creaks and moans at all hours of the night, especially let's say in the shoulder hours of an evening where maybe a day has been warm and it's gonna be a cool night or it's been a cold morning and then a warm afternoon. This was a constant issue with the tank in, in the North End. Local children in the North End were known to get um, twigs and go to the tank and basically twirl their twig and make a molasses um, popsicle, basically, and just you know suck on the molasses. Um, even though I don't think it was, um, you know, all that sweet. But even more so, homemakers would place pans, um, or bucket in some cases buckets at the base of the tank to collect molasses for you know baking beans and and cooking and and so on and so forth. So the, the tank began construction in um, October of 2015, and it was finished in late December. Um, Arthur Gell had given Hammond a deadline of December 31st, 2015, and it was close, but they actually made that, um, they made that deadline. Mike, can I check the dates? I mean, I'm assuming it's 1915, but the, this doesn't happen until 1919. That is correct, right. So there's three years in which this is fine-ish, leaky, and then disaster. Correct. So very good point, Alice. This tank is in operation for about three years and a couple of weeks. And it's being filled and emptied and filled and empty over the course of three years. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. So it did operate for three years rather noisily. Uh, it was leaking. People knew there was an issue. Arthur Gell knew there was an issue, but he basically chose to just disregard what was going on. So on Sunday, um, January 13th, um, 1919, the cargo ship Malerio pumped 500,000 gallons of fresh molasses into the tank. And this ship had come up from um, the West Indies. And at this point, the tank held approximately two and a half million gallons of molasses, nearly to the full height of the tank, which was approximately 50 feet. The tank on that day was filled to 48 feet, nine inches. And we think of a gallon of water, a gallon of water weighs about um, eight and a third pounds. 
a gallon of molasses is 50% more dense and weighs about 12 and a half pounds. So if you multiply 2.3 million gallons by 12 pounds, you get that the, the answer is that this molasses weighed approximately 26 million pounds and divide that by 2000 and you get 13,000 tons of molasses in a tank that hasn't been designed, built and or inspected properly. I mean, what, what could possibly go wrong, right? So 13,000 tons, this caught my interest. So prior to my presentations um, two years ago, I just did some research, some calculations, and uh, this is what I came up with. So keep 13,000 in the back of your, your minds. The weight of the Brooklyn Bridge, the steel wire, the masonry, weighs just under 15,000 tons. Now, the 14,600 tons, that does not include the anchorage at either end of the bridge. The anchorages, which are typically not seen because they're underground, they weigh on the order of 60,000 tons each. So I'm just really looking at the structure that we can see of the bridge. Um, one of the great engineering feats um, in the United States, the Roebling family construct the Brooklyn Bridge, and in the material weight is about 14,680 tons. Jump to um, France and Monsieur Bartoli's engineering feat, the Eiffel Tower, the steel or the iron that went into the Eiffel Tower weighs about 10,000 um, 100 tons. And then I thought I'd look at um, uh, Miss Liberty um, in New York. Um, Miss Liberty has done a great job staying fit and trim over the decades. Um, she comes in at a paltry 156 tons. And I think everyone knows the reason she is so light is that the Statue of Liberty is hollow and her skin is about the thickness of two copper pennies. So um, the weight of the Statue of Liberty is very, very minimal compared to some of these other um, objects. And I also, since I'm here in the Navy Yard, I looked at the um, USS Constitution and the Constitution weighs about 1500 tons. So again, this incredible weight of 13,000 tons concentrated in a 100 foot diameter tank was just a tremendous amount of weight. So here's the tank in the north end. Um, this again is on Commercial Street and the tank um, sent the molasses out in unidirectional. So it went as far as Cops Hill um, at the base of Cops Hill to Charter Street, and then it literally flowed over um, and went into the Charles River and, and Boston Harbor. I'm impressed that this is working, Alice. Here's a diagram of um, where things are. You can see the North End Beach, which is really the Popolo. Uh, playground today. And I should point out, both the Poplar Playground and Langone Park are undergoing a major renovation. They are wrapping up construction, though. They both parks look fabulous in what has been done, uh, what has been renovated and replaced. And to accommodate future sea level rise, uh, both parks have been have been literally uh, raised up to accommodate future sea level rise. So you can see we have a mix, we have a firehouse. Um, uh, Purity's office was literally um, next to the tank and you can see in parentheses that was flattened. Um, Cops Hill here, um, the base is a, a beautiful um, granite wall here. Um, we talked about that um, 
Boston Gas had a number of facilities in the North End. We saw one which is actually over here, but then there was another one here at number six, and that was that was damaged. Popolo um, Playground today, back then, 100 years ago, was actually the North End Beach. And it was uh, utilized by North End residents during summer months to, to escape the heat of Boston in, in, in July and August. So um, there are hundreds of photographs of um, the Great Molasses Flood. You can see here is the roof of that building. <coughs> Excuse me. The buildings have been flattened. The tank was back here, um, right back here. Um, and you can see everything has been flattened, basically. Here's the Berry, the Boston Elevated Railway over here to the left. You can see here's um, a, maybe a conductor or an engineer who has come out to basically look to see what has happened. Um, because no one knew initially what had happened. Boston Fire Department Firehouse picked up off its foundation and moved several feet um, from its foundation. If you can imagine, this is the berry, this is the elevated railway. These are girders, um, either iron or steel girders that have been bent. And you can see these are the plates. These are the walls of the tank that have been just basically brought to ground level and, and impacted. I mean, right here caused a crease. This was a vertical upright, just like this one. And you can see this one somewhat bent. This was a vertical upright that has been bent and creased. And this, these are very structurally sound members supporting this this trestle here. Here's another closer in view. You can see somehow that this girder, vertical girder did not get damaged, but you can see on the opposite side, and this is the residential portion of the North End, um, glass has been shattered in windows, um, buildings again, completely upended and knocked off their foundations. Um, Boston Fire Department responding. So what happened? People talk about an explosion. There really was not an explosion. And I, I know I'm dealing in semantics here, but what happened was the tank ruptured. The molasses, um, and even if there had been um, carbon dioxide from maybe fermentation, there was a vent. And it's clearly seen in some of the photographs that there was a vent to off gas or off vent any gases that have collected. So this tank really collapsed, or I like to use the term ruptured, because you had this massive weight of 13,000 tons of this liquid just pressing on the base of the tank. Engineers believe that it began at an access port. There was actually an access port at ground level and that first layer of steel plating or iron plating where um, workmen could come and go to clean the tank when the tank was empty. So again, this was a rupture. It happened right at lunchtime. Um, as I had mentioned, a beautiful, relatively warm afternoon on January 15, uh, 1919. So the tank collapses. You have molasses that initially was at 50 feet, comes down very quickly to 25 feet and starts moving at a speed of 35 miles an hour. I mean, has anyone been bumped by a car in a parking lot, you know, five miles an hour, 10 miles an hour? This is moving at a speed that's not allowed in the city of Boston. I mean, this is a tremendous speed for a flood of very thick gooey molasses. So you have um, sheets of steel um, 
being tossed about the site. The rivets, I talked about rivets being the primary means of fastening the tank. They actually became projectiles. Nearly everything in the path of molasses was carried off in literally in a wave of destruction. Um, one truck and a pedestrian uh, were swept into Boston Harbor. An L train with, with a berry train actually passed by the site as the tank ruptured. So the train of the berry passes by, the brakeman gets out, sees what's happened, and he runs on the trestle to stop the next train that would have actually come off and, and just created another nightmare on top of what was happening at ground level um, in the North End. So he was just at the right, he was the right person at the right time to dismount from his train and signal to the next car that they had to stop. So the aftermath, um, fortunately, there was the USS Nantucket, which was a training ship for cadets, was, was birthed right at the North End. And cadets, about 100 plus, came ashore to assist in the, in the rescue effort, the recovery effort. Um, 21 civilians were killed. Um, I had mentioned um, two youngsters, uh, one boy, one girl, each 10 years old. And then the oldest was a, um, a pensioner, but he was working as a laborer. He was 78 years old. About 150 civilians were injured. Horses were still being used um, in livery service around the city. And 2,000 horses also were, um, were victims of the flood. Cleanup took many weeks. Um, Basically, right through the summer, 300 laborers were hired, um, brooms, shovels, the molasses hardened that night, and they actually had to use picks and axes to chip through. And you, the Boston Fire Department actually tried to use fresh water from hydrants to cut through the molasses. It wouldn't work. So someone said, well, why don't we try salt water? So the fire department connected hoses directly into the Mystic River, Boston Harbor. And the only thing that was capable of cutting through the molasses was actually salt water. And the news accounts of the day say that the, the harbor, the inner harbor was brown until, until summer. So again, continuing with the aftermath, there were 100 separate, 119 separate lawsuits filed. They were all consolidated into a single legal proceeding. And this is really considered the first class action lawsuit in the United States as a result of the Great Molasses Flood. The case was overseen by a Boston native. Um, uh, he was a colonel in the US Army. Uh, colonel Ogden was both um, a soldier, had served in World War I, and he was also a lawyer, and he was named to oversee the entire case. To make a very long legal case short, um, in the end, even though US industrial alcohol said it was Italian anarchist who had placed a bomb that destroyed the tank, none of that was all conjecture. That was never, ever proven. Um, Colonel Ogden, at the end of the case, found in favor of, um, of the victims and the victims' families, and USIA paid out um, just over a half a million dollar in total claims. The settlements, and this was in the 1920 to 1921 timeframe, settlements were typically five to $6,000 uh, per victim. Um, the city of Boston received about $25,000 and the Berry about $42,000, <laughs> excuse me, for damages to their respective properties. Significant changes were made to laws and regulations governing construction, um, especially on tanks um, and cylinders and vessels with requirements that you need to have licensed architects and engineers from the get-go, from the concept of the tank 
through its design, construction, uh, approval, and then final inspections. And those are known as PE stamps or professional um, engineered stamps. Mike, we've got a few questions in the chat, but sure. I'll, I'll let you finish yeah. talking about the sign and then we'll. So um, I talked about signage. That is one of the um, goals of the Friends of the Boston Harbor Walk. This is the sign um, that will be installed hopefully this spring or summer um, near the site of the Great Molasses Flood at Langone Park, which I'd mentioned is being renovated as we speak. The construction is really wrapping up. And this is the, the fabulous work that Liz Nelson Weaver and her sign team work on. And this will go on, I call it uh, like an architect's desk type of um, stand. It will be ground mounted and the sign, the sign, this image will be mounted um, on that platform, on that architect's desk type of, um, of mounting. Great. Um, we have reached eight o'clock. We have a couple people with their hands up and a couple questions in the chat. So we're gonna pivot to those and we'll stick around to answer questions as long as people want to stick around and answer questions. But in case someone needs to go, I'm putting a link in the chat right now that will let you find out more about the Friends of the Harbor Walk. Um, you can go there to see videos of other webinars that have been done and Mike's webinars should be there next week. And you can always join the Friends at their monthly meetings. So all that information is there. Um, pivoting over to questions, um, someone, there's a couple of like mysteries people are trying to solve. Um, one of those is a question about, is it true that on a warm summer day, the scent of molasses can be detected because some of it hardened underground and softens in the heat? Very good. That is an urban myth. Um, I don't have firsthand knowledge of that, but I can tell you definitely a year or so or more after the Great Flood, the molasses had seeped into basements um, throughout the North End there. And I would not doubt that you could smell molasses in the, you know, in the years after the Great Molasses Flood. Could you possibly smell molasses today, a hundred years later in the North End, even on the warmest days? I, I think that's very, very unlikely because a lot of those buildings have been um, either demolished, a lot of them have been renovated. So I would say yes, um, within a few years of the flood, but today I would say that's an urban myth and you cannot still smell molasses in the North End. There's a similar question about the smell I think you've addressed. Um, it's also, is it also true that you can sort of see lines on buildings? Like you had this relic of the history because of the, like sort of like a molasses line. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't believe so. Um, no, because again, most of those buildings have been either renovated or unfortunately some of them were, you know, very, um, very nice in terms of architecture, but they were, torn down during either urban renewal or whatever the case may be. Great. Um, Brew wants to know what temperature molasses is kept at when it's in storage. What's normal? That is a good question. Um, the molasses at the time of the tank, because it was the winter, I think was relatively cold. But on the 15th, a new delivery was made and that has to be warmed. Um, to get it to flow. And I, I'm just guessing here, I don't know, but I would assume that the molasses would have to be, you know, 70 or 80 degrees to get it to flow from the vessel, offloading it um, into the tank. Um, and then you'd have this mix of um, mol warm molasses along with the ambient temperature, which was, again, the weather was relatively cold prior to the rupture of the tank. So the molasses could be you know, in the 40 degree range. Uh, thank you. There's a couple of questions about sort of how far it went. Did it make it all the way to Hanover Street? Where on Commercial Street did that molasses stop? Right, so from what I've seen, the farthest it made its way towards, let's say the Storiti Rink in Charlestown would be Charter Street. And Charter Street is definitely still there. Um, and then heading back towards the Coast Guard building, 
it did no it did not go from what I've seen as far as Hanover Street. It ended really at the base of Copps Hill. And there's a beautiful granite wall. And it really didn't go much farther than that granite wall. Yeah, I think it's also a model of, you know, we talk about climate change and resilience in that area. There's a similar issue or today, you know, that those same areas are protected because they're just that much higher than correct the in, the, in the street. Um, we've got a question in the chat. Um, more questions about how that molasses was unloaded. Um, it seems that the water was like not next to the tank. Did it was it taken through pipes? Like how did that, how did it move? Right. So if if we were to let's see, um, go back here. You can see where it says Charles River here that there was um, berthing available for ships. I'd mentioned that um, the training cadet ship was berthed here. The molasses ships would be berthed here. They would have flexible hoses from the vessel to hard piping. And the hard piping, I would assume, ran from really the dock all the way to the tank. So you had flexible hose um, from the vessel to a connection here somewhere um, where the warehouse was. And that flexible hose would connect directly to rigid piping and that rigid piping would connect directly to the tank. Great. Um, we also have a woman named Catherine who has patiently had her hand up. Catherine, I'm going to push allow to talk. And if you want to unmute yourself, you're, um, you're welcome to ask your question. not working. You're welcome to put your question in the chat as well, Catherine. All right. Um, oh, we've got one more Q&A here. How much longer did the elevated line on Commercial Street last after the spill? Good question. I believe to the 70s. So another 60 some odd years that the elevator was there and then um, Boston developed the orange line and other lines that really replaced the Berry and then the Berry, um, which went to North Station in right into Charlestown that was all disassembled um, and removed. I'd also encourage people if you want to know more about um, the history of that line, it's all on the Orange Lines Wikipedia page, having spent a lot of time there. <laughs> um, there's a lot of thanks here from different folks who have appreciated being here tonight. Um, someone asked about the cement tanks and the historic cement company at Black Falcon. She's suggesting it, I think, as a future talk. Um, there's also things a uh, note here from Ron about the elevated line coming down in part to use the steel for World War II. Um, and a couple more thanks. So for those of you who are still on tonight, thank you very much. Mike, I don't know if you have some final thoughts you want to wrap up with. Oh, great. Sure. Uh, thanks, um, Alice. Just a couple of books. Um, this is one by um, uh, Deborah Copps. Um, um, again, a very great um, a book about the Great Molasses Flood. But truly, the the definitive account um, of the Great Molasses Flood is called Dark Tide um, by a Bostonian, um, Stephen Puglio. I've gotten to know Steve. Um, he's very approachable. Um, this book is, it reads like a novel um, because he talks about the lives that the people lived in the North End and you can read it and not put it down. It's, it's really, it's an incredible book. You can see all my um, all my yellow stickies because he's just he's got phenomenal tidbits of information um, here um, in his book again dark tide Stephen Puglio um, the great Boston molasses flood of 1919 highly recommend this book along with um, the great molasses flood by 
by Deborah Copps. Super. We've got one more bonus question from Steve. Sure. What happened to that treasurer? Very good question. Believe it or not, he rushed the design, the construction of the tank because he wanted to get a promotion within USIA and become a vice president. I had mentioned the word antagonist. Believe it or not, even though the tank ruptured, killed 21 people, destroyed property, Arthur P. Gell was named a vice president and relocated to New York City. No criminal, this was not a criminal case, it was a civil case, and no one was charged criminally in the Great Molasses Flood. Oh, wow. So um, just to wrap up, um, here's my email address, feel free. Some people have asked um, through Alice, um, you know, we are going to post it. I'd be happy to send the PowerPoint presentation if you wanted to do, um, you know, something more in individualized, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And again, just thank you to all. I mean, we had a great turnout. Um, and again, for Alice, for um, being our technical support here, and then the friends of the Harbor Walk, my colleagues, personal friends that, um, that are on the webinar tonight. Wonderful. Mike, thank you so much for putting this together. We've got a bunch more thanks here in the chat. For those Excellent. of you who want to get more involved with the friends, bostonharbornow.org slash friends lets you watch videos of past presentations, find out more about this excellent all volunteer group and find out when their next meeting is. In fact, there's one tomorrow. So um, get those dates and reach out to Mike if you wanna be more involved. Have a great night and be safe, everyone. Excellent. Thanks again.